Part 4. Investigating the Impacts of Blade Length and Tower Height In the previous parts of this video, I examined the financial feasibility of a wind farm located at a very windy site using a particular choice of turbine. That turbine was appropriate for the site. Let's see how it would perform if it were used at a site with more moderate winds. I'm going back to the Global Wind Atlas and looking at our present location near St. Lawrence, Newfoundland. 100 meters off the ground, the wind speed is around 9 meters per second or even higher. Now let's look at this in terms of power density. Drawing a roughly 100 square kilometer rectangle, I see that good wind sites in the area have a wind power density around 840 watts per square meter at this same height. If I zoom out, I immediately notice that Newfoundland is more orange and red than most other parts of the world, signifying that it is especially windy there. In comparison, much of South America looks quite blue, indicating a weaker wind resource. But there are still some locations that show promise. For example, the Rio Grande do Norte state of Brazil has some areas with higher wind power density. Looking only at a region near the coast, I find that there would be sites with average wind speeds of almost 8 meters per second. This is only 12% lower than St. Lawrence. But remember, the power in the wind varies with the cube of its speed. The wind power density, or how much power is available from a 1 square meter area in the plane of the turbine rotor, is around 430 watts per square meter, nearly 50% lower than the 840 watts per square meter available at St. Lawrence. Back in Red Screen, on the Location page, I click on Select Climate Data Location. Navigating to northeastern Brazil, I drag the location thumbtack to my site. RetScreen selects Natal as the nearest location for climate data. I click on Paste Data to accept this. Examining the climate data for this site, I notice a few differences from Newfoundland. First, according to RetScreen, the annual average wind speed at 10 meters above the ground is 4.3 meters per second much lower than the 6.5 measured at St. Lawrence. Second, average air temperatures here are more than 20 degrees Celsius warmer than at St. Lawrence. Third, the atmospheric pressure is a bit lower than at St. Lawrence. A couple questions come to mind. How will the warm, less dense air affect turbine production? And does Redscreen's estimate of the wind speed at 10 meters translate to something comparable to 8 meters per second at 100 meters? as indicated by the Global Wind Atlas. Let's see. On the Energy page, I copy the values in the column showing the climate data to the input cells. Scrolling to the bottom of the Energy page, the impact of the hot climate with less dense air is revealed in the temperature coefficient. For St. Lawrence, it was 1.035. Here, it is 0 0.961. This corresponds to a downward adjustment in the wind farm production of more than 7% compared with St. Lawrence. If I temporarily change the hub height to 100 meters, I see that this 4.3 meters per second at 10 meter height translates to only 5.9 meters per second at 100 meters, much less than the nearly 8 meters per second from the Global Wind Atlas. This demonstrates that while sometimes the Red Screen Climate Database measurement of wind speed can yield a usable estimate for a wind farm, like at St. Lawrence, often it does not. A high resolution and accurate source of data near the hub height is essential. Now I'll demonstrate a slightly different approach to specifying the wind resource. I'm going to use the wind power density rather than the wind speed from the Global Wind Atlas. For the resource method, I select wind power density. Then in the wind power density cell, I enter 430 watts per square meter. Leaving all my other assumptions the same, I find that this results in a capacity factor of 24%. This is much lower than the 40% for St. Lawrence. It would be hard to build a profitable project with such a low capacity factor. Indeed, keeping costs as is, I could use the dashboard to determine what the project would need to be paid per kilowatt hour in order for it to be profitable. On the energy page, I adjust the electricity export rate until the pre-tax internal rate of return on equity is equal to the discount rate of 
and therefore the net present value is zero. It turns out that the project would need to be paid around 9.5 Canadian cents per kilowatt hour for it to be profitable. Fortunately, the wind industry has done a lot to improve turbine performance in modest and low wind speed regimes. The first tactic is to use longer rotor blades, or smaller drivetrains for a given rotor size. The second is to use taller towers. Regardless of the rated power of the drivetrain, the input power that a turbine has to work with is related to the swept area of the rotor. If the wind resource is weak, longer blades will increase the input power and raise the capacity factor, assuming the generator is kept the same. In the RETScreen product database, I see that the same V90 turbine comes in a 1.8 megawatt version. It also has a 90 meter rotor. With a smaller rated power, but the same rotor size, the capacity factor should go up. I'll select the version with the 95 meter tower. It is slightly higher than the turbine we had thus far, so to compare apples with apples, I'll overwrite the hub height with 90 meters. Now the capacity factor is 32%. This is much better. On the other hand, all the fixed costs associated with this wind farm have stayed roughly the same, but the nameplate capacity has fallen to 50 megawatts. On the finance page, the result has been positive. The IRR has risen from 9% to 14%. Remember that we showed that the wind speed generally increases with height. This suggests that if we could find a version of this turbine with a taller tower, we might also see an improvement in the capacity factor. If I enter 120 meters as the hub height, the capacity factor rises to 34%. This is for a wind shear exponent of 0.14. If the wind shear exponent were 0.25, the capacity factor would be 35% since the wind speed is increasing by a larger amount for a given increase in height. Would it be reasonable to enter 0.25 as the wind shear exponent? After all, our project looks better that way. Unfortunately, we are not at liberty to specify whatever we want. Our choice must reflect the roughness of the terrain. At a given height off the ground, rougher terrain slows the wind down more, giving rise to more wind shear. But this slowdown also affects our wind speed measurement, so if the terrain is rougher, we are less likely to have found a high wind speed to begin with. Maybe the wind speed at our site is high because the roughness is low. The Global Wind Atlas provides information about the roughness. As speculated, the area I have selected due to its higher wind speed has a very low roughness length. This indicates that the ground cover doesn't slow the wind much except when measured very close to the ground. Thus, we'd better stick with a low wind shear exponent, like the 0.14 we used originally. Now our IRR is almost 17% if the price is 9.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Using the dashboard, I can show that the project would break even with the electricity price under 8 Canadian cents per kilowatt hour. Of course, taller towers cost more and that was not reflected in the analysis, but I also used a significantly smaller drivetrain, which might cost less, and I didn't adjust my fixed costs at all, even though these might not be perfectly invariant with project size. In the real world, you'd need to refine your analysis with real cost data. Before I shared this analysis with anyone, I might want to clean it up a bit. I changed the name to 50 megawatt wind farm to reflect the updated capacity of the project. Also, I'd eliminate the four versions of the project generated by the Virtual Energy Analyzer that I have ignored, even though they have been deselected in the Include System table and therefore don't affect my analysis in any way, they might cause confusion. I can remove them by right-clicking and selecting Delete. This concludes this video on how to analyze grid-tied wind power projects with RETScreen Expert. If this was useful to you, you might want to follow the other RETScreen Expert videos you can find by clicking on the e-learning icon at the right of the home screen under the file tab.